And I think that really relates to like the frog in the well in the sense that you want to carry different perspectives and how different types of history kind of work together. Annyeonghaseyo, everyone. This is Mark Peterson with the Frog Outside the Well Research Center. And today I've got a special guest, a junior in high school in Korea, who heard me give a lecture and had some questions about it. So she contacted me. And I thought her questions were really good. And I thought, well, this might make a video. So this is Kay Park, uh, also known as Kyungyun Park. But uh, she is now a junior in high school. And the group that I was lecturing to, that Kay was in, uh, as I understand it, it's a group of volunteers who give yeah. service of uh, guidance. Mm -hmm. They give tour guides at the palace and some other places. Is that right? Yes, yes, definitely. And so you're interested in learning mm -hmm. a bit more about Korean history from my perspective. So firstly, the question I have is just to start us off, there's a lot of statements made about history and definitions and reasons why we need to learn history. I think in terms of Korean education system, it's the first lesson where they talk about um, there are no, there's no future for a nation that doesn't know its history. And in terms of IB history, which is international history, they also talk about what is history in general. Um, and I think my teacher in, um, in specific, he actually made con a connection to the book by E.H. Carp of what is history. So I just wanted to ask you um, as a professional and also a historian about why we should learn history and what do you think history is and why is it so important? Well, we should learn history so we don't make the same mistakes again. Um, there are political leaders who don't know history very well. Uh, Donald Trump is one, and he, he does it amazing how much he doesn't know about history. But there are other uh, presidents and other leaders who understand history and understand the dynamics of nations and the way things work. So one thing, it'll help us to avoid wars. It'll help us to avoid problems. It'll help us to avoid mistakes. Uh, we, the citizens of the world, <laughs> maybe more of the citizens of the United States, I've made a lot of mistakes about Korea. The United States did not protect Korea against the Japanese in 1910. And then at the end of World War II in 1945, the Americans allowed the Russians to claim war territory. And the war territory ends up uh, the northern half of the Korean Peninsula, but it should have been the northern half of Japan because you look at Germany after the war, it was divided into four parts and Russia got one part. And uh, uh, Japan should have been divided up as the perpetrator of the war. But instead, Korea was divided. Korea was the uh, victim of the war, the first victim of the war. Uh, and yet they're victimized again after the war. So if we understood history a little bit better and if people understood uh, uh, historical facts and historical dynamics, we might not make some of the same mistakes. So that's the biggest reason to study history. And also uh, another thing is uh, the anthropologists say history is charter. And by charter, they mean a manifesto or a set of guidelines that people operate by. Everybody has a charter, whether you use that word or not. Everybody has a charter that this is good, this is bad, we do this, we don't do this. Uh, history is charter. History sets up a standard of what we are and what we do. And uh, history is also very political and very nationalistic. And in fact, I'm concerned now in Korea about a strong nationalistic movement that I think is quite unhealthy that's trying to rewrite history in a very uh, nationalistic sort of way. So those are the, my views on history in general. It's definitely right in terms of what different people are saying around the world it all leads to what you your response right now and that they don't want to repeat the same mis mistakes again and history is to be honest all interconnected the, even though you have korean history u.s history different types of history it's all connected and they come to one conclusion of a big theme i i think so i think in, it, it's relevant in that sense 
Well, that's um, what I'm trying to say with my frog outside the well imagery. Um, I am critical of Korean historiography as being Uran yeah. Hegri. Uh, that a lot of Korean history books, you look at the history book and it'll have this map and this map and Sanguk uh, Shide and all this sort of stuff, but uh, no international context, no place with Korea in East Asia or in the Western Pacific. And those are important issues in uh, modern life. So, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. So that's one thing I'm trying to add to the, to the discussion. I was more focused on Korean history before and how it's all connected to each other, how Korean War was also uh, like influencing the civil rights movement, how uh, President Truman and Eisenhower kind of um, looked at all of the foreign uh, relationships between each countries and kind of had each focuses de depending on which perspective that he had. And I think that really relates to like the frog in the well in the sense that you wanna carry different perspectives and how different types of history kind of work together. What I really want to ask you is in terms of foreign relations when talking about Korea, I think that the relationship between Korea, Japan and China can't be left out. And one thing that really angers me and all, all of Korean citizens probably is that um, before Japan used to call kimchi theirs, calling it like kimchi, and also like mentions tokdo, which still they push through. And I, I don't think Korean people tends to get the feeling that it's it's getting resolved. Like, um, yes, we have gotten apologies in some aspects, but it doesn't help um, solve the relationship get any better and now China is claiming that kimchi like Pekduzan mountain or like Hamburg is theirs and also like not even just claiming but actually implementing stuff that they can actually um, force or like actually put the, out to the public. Well in regard to the cultural claims that the Chinese mm -hmm. have been making about kimchi and Hanbok and uh, and all these sorts of things I think it's best to just ignore them. <laughs> I don't think they're, you know, earnest about it. And it, it's sort of a silly thing. Uh, but behind it is China's grasping for power and recognition as the major power in the world. Mm -hmm. They send astronauts into space and they have great trade and great economy. And uh, they want to be considered the number one power in the world. And uh, that's a little bit frightening to Korea, but I would say to Koreans that you need to be confident. Korea has always been confident in the face of aggression from outside. Uh, we don't need to panic. We don't need to run and hide, but we should, we meaning we Koreans, including <laughs> myself, we should be confident in our culture. And uh, one of my favorite phrases is to say, Koreans speak Korean. And that means that over the centuries, the Chinese never dominated Korea. Koreans speak Korean. Now that's not true of the Manchus. The Manchus went into China and started speaking Chinese and they lost their language. There's no Manchu speakers at all to speak of. There are a couple of villages up in Manchuria, in Northeast China that uh, there's still some people that speak a Manchu language. And the Mongols conquered China and they started learning Chinese. And now Mongol, Mongolia is a very insignificant, tiny little country. But Korea, in spite of the pressures from China, in spite of any pressures from Japan, in spite of the Japanese occupation period when the Japanese tried to snuff out the Korean culture and the Korean language, it doesn't happen. So I think the, the phrase Koreans speak Korean says it all. And Koreans will continue to speak Korean. Uh, I think the Chinese, one reason they're asking so strangely uh, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, striking out at Korea culturally is that I think they feel intimidated by the Koreans. Uh, the Koreans have been so successful so much early on than, than China ever was. And uh, China is just lately starting to catch up and starting to develop some economic power. But, uh, you know, China has been a buddy of North Korea for all these years. And you talk to the Chinese about it, they, they laugh about North Korea. 
They think North Korea is a joke. It's an economic basket case. It has no freedom or openness. Uh, China used to be closed. I went into China in 1987, and I was one of the first uh, Westerners to go into some of the regions. I went up to Yenbyan, where the, where the Koreans live, in 1987. And the door had just barely been open, and, and uh, the Chinese were anxious to talk to Westerners. On the train going up there, a guy came up to me and said, hey, I want to import motorcycles. Can you help me out? <laughs> I, said, well, I don't know anything about motorcycles. I can't help you out. But uh, there's a drive for business and business success in China. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're taking it to too strong of a limit. Uh, it's a little bit disquieting, but I think it's okay. I think the Koreans need to just be confident in themselves that everything will be okay. Yeah, I think that's the one of the most things that we need to work on in terms of like having confidence in what we have. And I think this is the type of like perspective differences that only in a third person perspective could come in and talk to us about it. I was born in 2004. So by the time I was in elementary school, middle school, like in Korea, it was a big thing that we needed to put ourselves on a more international stage so everyone in it around the world would know and I think I can like relate to this problem back in the day because I used to live in America for one year and I lived in Florida so it wasn't like a big city where everyone was like civilized it was just like a chill little county um, and I went to a public school there and I was in first grade and people would come up to me because I was the only Asian in our school and they would be like, oh, you're from China. And I, I would say, no, I'm Korean. Being the little girl that couldn't speak English. Um, and I would, and people would say, where's Korea? Like, and I, I would, I would say, what's your mom's phone? I'm sure your mom's phone is from Samsung or LG or the car that you ride. It's from you Hyundai. Would say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they would say, yeah, but they're from Korea. I don't know where Korea is. Like, and I think that's where the point where I really started taking interest in like history and like putting our country out there. And now BTS just won a award from the AMA and like Korean culture is like, huge like k-pop k-food um but now yeah, i mean the academy award for best picture that was huge yeah <laughs> for, and not not yeah. just like yeah not just k-pop but also like parasite all the different movies that people are presenting and i think koreans have gone internationally like a lot compared to back in the days. But now my hope is really advertising and let, letting people know what Korean history is, what Korean culture is, what their needs, why people needs to see this. Even when visitors visit Korea, because I'm a tour guide, I would know that people more focus on like visiting like entertainment centers or um, just trendy places rather than going to like palaces or museums that they really need to know which is essential to understanding Korea as a whole. Um, so my question would be as a professional and also a foreigner, what part of Korean history and Korean culture do you think should be more advertised in order to achieve the goals that I've mentioned? And how do you think it should be advertised so that it would really grab the attention of people internationally? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Um, I would like to issue a warning that BTS will not always be that popular. Yeah. And Korea may not win another best mm -hmm. uh, picture uh, Academy mm -hmm. Award uh, because popular things come and go. It's a sign curve. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What we want is to see the base understanding of Korea uh, to be solidified. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying about that uh, base culture uh, in history and understanding the culture of Korea is a very good thing that would keep uh, the, the side curve from dropping off the end. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add one other thing. You say you've been studying the American uh, civil rights movement. Uh, yes. I'd like to add the uh, emphasis on education. Mm -hmm. that, uh, the underlying reason that Korea has such a great international pop, uh, popularity uh, is the same reason the economy is booming. And the same reason that uh, Korea is going to survive strongly, and that is the educational background. Korea has a strong education, and that means everything. Uh, that means everything. Uh, you talked about uh, Floridians uh, in a rural area not knowing where Korea was. 
Uh, you could go to Kansas or Montana or a number of other places and you'd get the same sort of response because the drive for education is, is much uh, weaker in America, unfortunately. But fortunately for Korea, this drive for education is very, very strong. People say these days that the uh, uh, Korean people are overeducated. And there, uh, there's a sense to which that's true. There's a sense to which that's nonsense. Uh, overeducated in the sense that they don't have as many technical workers to run machinery and such. Everybody gets a college degree. I had a group of uh, teachers in Korea at one point. We were in the hotel uh, coffee shop. And I said to the teachers, or six or seven of them, the wait staff here, what, what are the chances you suppose that the wait staff uh, have all graduated from college? And they looked at the other, no, oh, wait staff in an American hotel, uh, they'd be high school or you know, maybe a little bit of college, but they wouldn't be college graduates. So the first uh, waitress that came over, uh, I, I said, uh, hey, where'd you go to college? She told me. Uh, you have a bachelor's degree? Yeah. The next one that came over, same thing. And uh, there were two others and I asked about them. Yeah, they all had college degrees. Yeah. And to this group of teachers that I was talking to, that, that was amazing. It, it blew them away. So in that sense, Korea is a little bit overeducated. They have a lot of uh, schools that are suffering now because there aren't enough enrollments to feed the schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're sort of overpopulated, but uh, this will work out. This is a sign curve of every other sort of economic development. Uh, it, it'll work out. But one thing they're doing to uh, keep their schools open is they're bringing in students from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and, and Myanmar. I gave a couple of lectures in Korea the last time I was there before COVID and mm -hmm. uh, at a couple of international uh, departments of universities for all international students. And that's an amazing thing. And those students who are coming from Central Asia and Southeast Asia, Philippines, even from Japan, they all thought Korea was great. They loved Korea. So, you know, there are a lot of positive things. Um, I'm not gonna worry too much. I think Korea is gonna be okay. The next question is really about the whole of this channel and the passion that I have towards looking at your videos. And I think I have been lacking that and you, your content and your channel really pushed me to think in various perspectives. And the thing that I thought was the most intriguing about your lecture is that you point out fresh opinions that are really out of the ordinary for me as a Korean, or in some ways break, breaking the stereotype of how people think and take in history. So for example, you've said that Koreans tend to have a bit of a victim mentality because after the Japanese invasion in 1592, we lost so many things. But you also pointed out that even though it is true that the Japanese invasion was one of the biggest wars that happened to that point of history, um, you we should really take more pride rather than feeling victimized. So so I really wanted to ask you how you see all these different events in history in such a new perspective and interpret them in that way. And if you have a tip for us students or just in general, anyone to see history in various perspectives. Yeah, the, uh, the biggest theme that I've been addressing is this idea of victimization and this idea that Korean history is full of turmoil and chaos and Koreans have always been the victim. They've been invaded by this country, that country, the other country. And it's a terrible exaggeration. And it's, uh, it, it, it's demeaning to the Korean psyche to always think of oneself as a victim. Now, Korea was victimized in the 20th century. There's no question about that. Uh, the division was not Korea's intent. The occupation by Japan was not uh, Korea's intent. And they were victimized in the 20th century. But my point is, you can't cast the 20th century on the whole long history of Korea. If you, if you take the 20th century and put it aside for just a minute and look at the rest of Korean history, you have remarkable stability. I've been asked to write an article for the newspaper about the new year. And this next year is Im In He, Im In Yang, the tiger year. And uh, I looked up Im In, to see if there were any bad things that happened in history to say the tiger is a, you have to be careful of the tiger year, you know. 
uh, I, I asked the question at the beginning of the article, is the tiger going to come in and scare away the coronavirus and all the bad things? <laughs> or is the tiger going to come in and eat us up? Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of tiger years have we had in the past? And I looked up emo uh, year. And you know, there are some famous years in Korean history, like uh, Imjin, mm -hmm. is the way we refer to the Japanese invasion of 1592. Imjin. Yeah. From now on, Imjin is forever labeled as the bad year. And uh, Pyongja and Cheongyo are the Manchu invasions. Those are bad years. Uh, Kyungsul was the annexation of Korea by the Japanese in 1910. So some of these years have negative connotations. Yeah. So I looked up Imin 60 years ago, 120 years ago, 180 years ago, every 60 year cycle, I looked up Imin. Nothing happened. <laughs> there's not a there's not a significant okay. event in any Emin year. In 1722, there was a purge of a bunch of uh, officials that the king didn't like. Uh, this was Kyung Jong before Young Jo took over, mm -hmm. uh, but it was you know insignificant. And you go back all the way through history, nothing happened in Emin. So, so in my article, I'm going to say, hey, let's not worry about the year of the tiger. We're going to be okay. <laughs> the tiger might just scare away the, the demons and the virus, and maybe we'll be okay. So I'm going to take a very optimistic uh, view. Hey, well, let's uh, let's say goodbye to the folks now. And, and Kay, maybe we can meet again sometime if you have some more questions. Yes, 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 definitely. <laughs> okay. We'll see you. Bye. Bye.